So the, the, the next section, I sort of did the next two sections in reverse, in a way. Because implicit <coughs> differentiation makes a little more sense when you have a, a purpose for it, right? Um, so what's interesting is a couple of you guys asked me a certain question on that worksheet that I semi-lied to you a little bit about because I didn't want you getting it confused with something coming up later. Um, but if I have a problem like this here, uh, so that probably didn't hear. Oh, what was it? It was five to the x squared minus three x. Is that the one? Yeah. A couple of you guys asked me if you could take a natural log of both sides, and I said no. Right. There is a way you could do it. You just have to use what's called implicit differentiation. So implicit means that there is an implied function of x, not an explicit function of x. This is an explicit function of x. Y is explicitly a function of x. No question about it. The minute I take a natural log of both sides, Now I've kind of lost what y is as a function of x. It's implicitly a function of x. So you guys are like, well, it's semantics bullshit. No, not really, right? If it's, if it's explicit, that side is easy to do. That side I can focus on. Implicit, now y itself has stuff happening to it. It's a chain rule. I don't know if you guys remember, this is how we did the stuff yesterday for to figure out what natural log would be. This is the natural log of a function of x. How would I take its derivative? How do you take the derivative of a natural log of a function of x? Well, how do you take the natural log of anything? How do I do that derivative? So it'd be 1 over y. It's y here, right? But y is a function of x times dy dx or y prime and matter. So far, so good. So implicit just means that not only is x having shit happen to it, but y could be having shit happen to it also. When you take it rid of, with respect to something with x in it, x prime is 1. It's that x prime is not going to show up because x prime dx dx is 1. dy dx, though, is not 1. It's just whatever the shit it is. All right, let's keep going. That's just a constant. Is that cool? Yeah. So this will be... 2x minus 3 times ln of 5, right? How are we going to support? No, no good. What, what happened? What's the matter? What happened? Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Everybody's cool on that step there, right? It's okay if you're not. Tell me now. Is everybody cool with that? I just took lns of both sides, so that can come down. No worries. Uh, what's the derivative of ln of x squared? How do you do that derivative, for example? Yeah, it'll be 1 over x squared times 2x. So, and then you can simplify that. It gives a shit. If I made it x cubed, 1 over x cubed times 3x squared, right? So what if I just made it, I'm not going to tell you what the function is. I'm going to call it y, because y equals a function of x. So what's the rule then? It would be 1 over y times the derivative of, of y, which is exactly what we had here, right? y is a function of x. So when I take the derivative with respect to x, that's y prime. It's dy dx. That's what it means by implicit. Wherever y is, it is a function of x. So when I take the derivative with a function of x in it, I've got to use chain rule, right? That's just chain rule here. Is that, is that cool? Same thing we used when I had an actual explicit function of x inside there. Oh, you guys like this, right? Now on this side, is everybody cool with what I had over here? 
on this side? I could distribute that shit, and, but I don't really have to. It's just 2x times that minus 3 times that, right? So I'm just going to put 2x and minus 3 times that. <coughs> the, the constant comes for the right. Yes, sir? Only if it's multiplied. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can I solve for y prime? Yeah. Yes. I just got to multiply by y. What was y, though? What was y? What is y? Isn't this what we got? Times 2x minus 3 times... Isn't this what we got? Isn't this what we got? If you look back, that's what we got. Right? Of course. I mean, it's just because I come up with a new way of doing things, it's got to jive with the old way or else it's bullshit. Now, there are relations where it is impossible to solve for y. This should not be that big of a step for you guys to realize. You, you, so, for example, it's, it's, let me show you a true, pure, implicit differentiation problem. <coughs> Somebody, can somebody solve for y? Before anybody starts to do it, you can't. You just can't. Why? Why? And that y is stuck inside of a cosine. But if you take inverse cosines at some point, won't that y be stuck in inverse cosine? Yep. Shit. So I can't get an explicit function of y. This is not a function. If you graph this somehow, it's going to curve on itself and do all kinds of shit. So you can't put it into a graphing calculator because graphing calculator needs y equals, and I can't solve for y. So things that where you can't break them apart, you can't get y by itself, they are very interesting pictures. They just kind of curve all over the place. They go whatever the shit they want to. Weehaw! If it's y equals, it can't come back on itself because then it's not a function. So it has to, it can never come back on itself. Is, are, are you guys cool with that? So this is not a function of x or y, but it's still a valid equation. It's still a valid relationship. I have to be able to figure out what dy dx is. Because whatever it looks like, there's a slope at every point. There's a slope. You guys with me? It could even look like a spirograph. You remember the spirograph things? Anybody ever heard of the spirograph things where you put the pencil in the gear and you turn it around and it makes all of it? I like it. Later this semester, we're going to actually see the, the equations behind those things. Yeah, we will, even if you don't want to. Uh, <laughs> I like that reaction. All right, so let's take this guy's derivative. So how do you do the derivative of cosine of something? It's negative sine of that thing, right? Now, just to make it easier on myself, what I'm going to do is right, x, y minus x prime, right? That, that's chain rule. I'm not doing all the derivatives at once, so I go a little insane. I'm just saving that for the next step. That's what I mean by write the rule. This is easy. Now, how can I rewrite this up here? <laughs> yeah, 3x to the y to the so how am I going to take that guy's derivative What's what rule is it going to involve to do it it's 3x invert 3x in negative 1 times y in negative 1 so it's a product rule so what's the derivative of 3x to the negative 1 <laughs> good times this Plus, now this gets a turn. What's the derivative of y to the negative 1? 
Yeah, so negative 3x, negative 1. Y, negative 2 times what's inside the negative 1 function? Y. And what's Y? Function of x. So anytime you take a derivative with, with y in something, you have to multiply by y prime. That's the step, that's the key step about implicit. It's exactly the same shit we've been doing. I want you to really understand. It's exactly my point with that ln thing I did over here earlier. How do you do the ln of some function of x? How do you do that, guys? Derivative. It would be 1 over that function times the derivative of that function. Also, if it's y, it's just 1 over y to the derivative of y. Bam. So how do I do the derivative of y to the negative 1? Negative y to the negative 2 times the derivative of the inside. So somebody might say, well, why didn't you do that shit here, Jeff? Because what's x prime? 1. So it doesn't show up. But what's y prime? I don't know. It's the thing I want to solve for. I want to solve for dy dx. All right, so I'm not done with derivatives yet. So here I got my negative sign, xy minus x, times, how, what's this guy's derivative? What's this going to involve? You could, but you don't have to. Uh, what's the derivative of xy going to be? It would be derivative of x is 1 times y plus x times the derivative of y. What's the derivative of y? Y prime, I love it. And of course the derivative of x is one. Uh, let's see, this is yummy. Uh, let's see, let's just write this. Is minus three x negative one, y negative two, y prime. Oh, it's so yummy. I don't think you know what that word means, Jeff. Where are my y primes at? So, so what am I trying to solve for here? What was it from the very beginning? I'm trying to find the derivative. I'm trying to find the slope, the dy dx. I got to get y prime by itself. How do you solve for any variable? Get everything with that variable on one side, everything that doesn't have that variable on the other side, and then divide by the shit you don't want. That's how you always do it. You've ever done it since the beginning of math? No, you So then I've got, if I distribute this stuff, let's see, negative y sine xy minus x plus minus xy prime sine of xy minus x plus sine xy minus x. Okay, that's just distributing that through. Is that, is that cool? I need to distribute it so everything's able to move. <coughs> So then I can move all my y prime shit together and all my non y prime shit on the other side. Uh, plus 1 over x equals negative 3x negative 2 y negative 1. Minus 3x negative 1 y negative 2 y prime. So everything with a y prime in it, I want it on the same side. So let me see if I can do this. I'm going to move this over here so it can be with this dude. And I'm going to move these two things over there because they don't have a y prime in them. Right? How do you solve an equation? Get all this shit with x in it on one side and all the other stuff on the other side. That's all I'm doing. I'm trying to solve for y prime. That's what I'm going to do. So I add that piece over. equals, and I subtract, uh, and, you know, I add this piece, I subtract that piece, I subtract it to the other side, because they don't have any y primes. They don't have the thing in it that I want to use by itself. So that'll be y minus 3x negative 2y negative 1. Uh, let me see. Minus sine xy minus x minus 1 over x. So that piece went over, that piece went over, that piece went over. Did it? Yes, it did. Ah. And then this piece came over here. All right. And some of you guys gave up on this problem just because it's, it's a little longer than you like. All right, that's bullshit. This is what's called building up your math stamina. What's up? Does everything look okay? 
So we'll add that over. That's an X, right? Because that was Y on the first, um, on the right hand side, on the, the first uh, curve. Sine x, y, minus. Oh yeah, this is minus x, yeah. Thanks. H. Poor little thing got overly wide out. Wait, and now... Did you distribute the negative sine x, y? Yeah, so negative y this, uh -huh. negative uh, there, and then negative times negative is plus. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And why did I do that? So that my y prime piece was <laughs> able to move if I need and the other pieces are able to get the hell out of the way. Not a big deal. This is after this step after from here to there, that's the end of calculus. The rest of this is algebra. So you guys like that doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> uh, and now how do I get y prime by itself? Take it out. Take it out. Y prime is it okay please and that divide by the other shit, right? It'd be y prime times shit we divide by? And then we're done. Over 3x negative 1, y negative 2, minus x sine x y minus x. See, that's the stuff without the y prime. Is that pretty? No. I would argue yes, yeah, freaking beautiful. But yes, I understand. Your answer would be no, it's not pretty. But I should expect it to be. And, and, and remember, this is a freaky ass equation. My God. You can't even begin to graph this thing with what you've got. So, of course, it's going to have an exceptionally freaky derivative, right? I'm, I'm a little weird. I like to start off with these horrendous ones. So let's take a step back. Let's look at some that are not quite this horrendous. I love it, because some of you guys are like, is this like the easy example? Yes. Uh, to the last part, the very last line, I said it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> Get tired. It's that. Okay. All right. So this is a nice exercise I want to call math. Stamina. Just being able to survive writing all this shit out and moving it around. <laughs> yeah, I know. So you guys look, I'm going to skip that one and hopefully you don't notice. Um, <laughs> that's fun, that shit. <laughs> all right, has everybody got that as much as they want? Let's look at one a little bit easier, right? Can you guys write down the equation of a circle at the, centered at the origin with radius 4? Write down the equation for a circle centered at the origin with radius 4. Do it. Equation of a circle centered at the origin with radius 4. This is something you should be able to do. What principle is the equation on a circle based on? Well, it's based on the Pythagorean theorem. Right? And if you've done trigonometry, as all of you have, then you should even be more intimately aware of that because the unit circle is where we start the whole sine cosine shit, right? And it just explodes. Um, so this will be x squared plus y squared because it hasn't been shifted because the center is still 0, 0. You don't have to do any shifts. And it equals r squared. That grand theorem. So really, a circle definition is uh, all the points that are equidistant from a certain point called the center. So when I draw this, I've created a right triangle. This side is x long, this side is y long, and this side has got to be 1 for the unit circle, for example. In this case, I want it to be 4 for my, my circle. So, of course, x squared plus y squared equals 4 squared. It's just Pythagorean stupid theorem, right? Not stupid, but I don't know. 
Pythagoras didn't do it, by the way. His followers did most of his work, and he took the credit. Oh, well. That's the way the history is. <laughs> now, can we take this guy's derivative? Try to do that implicit differentiation. Much nicer than the one we just did, right? Let's try it out. See if it makes sense. And, and all you guys are doing, I think, at this point, what I mean by that point, I mean like a 45 degree angle, like right at that point, what should the slope be at that point? What does your gut tell you the, the slope should be at that point? One thing you can tell them right off, it should be negative. But we should be able to figure out, should, what, negative what? Negative one. Does that make sense? That should be a negative one slope. Because that's a one slope, that should be a negative one slope. How are we doing so far? All right, so whatever we get, when I plug that point in, it better freaking say negative one or else it's bullshit. So how do you guys start this off? What do you, how do you think the derivative? 2x. 2y. 2y. Y prime. Y prime. Y prime. Equals zero. Now solve for y prime. So you get negative 2x over 2y. The twos die. So you get x over y, negative. I like it. And if I plug in, now at this point, x and y are going to be equal, right? 45 degrees? So you can figure out exactly what it is because the radius of 4, blah, blah, blah. But who cares? They're equal. So I do get negative 1. So that does describe, for any point on the circle, if I had some other point where I knew x and y, I could just plug both the x and the y piece. This is really weird. This is a function that takes x and y as inputs. It takes both parts of the points as an input. Do you guys see that? Now, in this case, there is more I can do. I can almost get an explicit function of y. Right, there's one little stupid thing that makes it me have to say almost. How do you solve this thing for y? <coughs> How do you solve that for y? <coughs> we probably subtract x squared. And then you take square, square root. And of course, the minute you take a square root, you better put... Yeah. So that's why it's truly not an a explicit function. And explicit function because there's two functions staring me in the face there, right? But still, I could plug that in and have a derivative only dependent on x. Can I always do that? No, I could solve this one for y, sort of. It's still dependent on what quadrant I'm in with the point, right? To figure out what the plus or minus, you guys with me? What's that plus or minus imply? Which, which hemisphere you're in, right? The top or the bottom? Um, but I can at least get it to a point where I get y by itself. Can I always do that with relationships in this section? No. I, I can have stuff that we just saw, that really ugly one, where you just cannot pull them apart. There's no way. Are right, you guys semi? Okay. What's uh, Three, five. I like the way it's spelled circle. 3, 5 is implicit differentiation. So let's do, um, yeah. Uh, so for the test on Thursday, is it just set to 3, 5, 5? No, no, no. Three, three, six. Three, six. To be honest, we sort of already did most of three, six. Three, six is all about figuring out the derivative of natural log. 
We already know that because Jeff doesn't like the way the book orders things. It made so much more sense to start the discussion of 3.5 with an actual problem that we might be interested in. Right? What the shit is the derivative of the natural log? And we've got to come up with a new method to do it. And now that method, unfortunately, we open it up. Now that method is out there. And you're going you're gonna to see it. Um, which is this implicit differentiation business. Right? Uh, let's see. What about... All right, all right. Let me throw this one at you. What about um, an ellipse? Centered at um, uh, negative one three how oh, would that start off? Uh, and let me say what else can I tell you? Uh, the the semi major oh do you guys remember any of this stuff? Semi major axis length Semi-minor axis length. Equals three. Do we need another for the test? Like, in the loops and then minor, major, and all You that? might need to know anything you're supposed to know. Uh, you're supposed to know this. Uh, if you went through gross one, you got it in 110, you got it again in 176. So it seems like it might be important. Oh shit! Yeah, it's just like if you took an art class and you went to art four and you weren't sure how to hold the brush, that's a problem. That was something you're supposed to get earlier, right? Oh, Jeff's being such a dork right now. But I'm not going to throw something at you completely out of left field. I probably wouldn't make you put this together. But I need you to notice what something is for sure. If I gave you the equation and said, what is the equation of? You need to tell me if it's an ellipse versus hyperbola versus circle. That level you should certainly be able to. Let's try to put this thing together. Um, and let me say it's, uh, well, screw it. I'm just going to put one example of this together. I'm not going to try to figure out more stuff to tell you. So this would be, well, since it's negative 1, what's going to be here? X plus 1. And let's just say this deals with X. So what's going to be underneath here? <clears throat> yeah, so 4. And it's an ellipse, so it's certainly a plus y minus 3 squared. This has got to deal with y, so that's 9. So the main difference between circles and ellipses are these numbers are different for ellipses. For circles, these numbers would be the same. And of course, it makes sense. Since these numbers are different, it goes out in the x and the y direction a different amount. It's not symmetric in both directions. That's why an ellipse looks like a circle somebody sat on, Stewie's head or whatever, somebody did this too. Okay, so take this guy's derivative. Find dy dx.
let me try to catch up to you. Notice how the inside of this is linear with a slope of one. You'll start to know to look for that. So that means it basically is the same as if it was just x. So what I mean by that, two's gonna come down times this. The really the inside's one. So two over four, so you get one half x plus one. Is, is that is that cool? Two comes down, one half times this through the first. Through the inside's one, so it doesn't even show up. No, we didn't like that. So the two comes down to the first power now, right? Over four is just sitting there. Times the derivative of the inside, which is one. So that's one half x plus one, like I had. What's going to happen to this guy? Yeah, the 2 comes down. 2y minus 3 over 9 times what's the derivative of the inside? y prime. What's the derivative of 1? 0. 0, okay. And I just got to solve for y prime. So you subtract that over. Oh crap, Jeff, you're really skipping a lot. 2y minus 3 over 9y prime. And then you multiply by the reciprocal. Is that cool? So you get y prime equals negative 9 over 4, x plus 1 over y minus 3, become a minus. So you get 9 halves times negative 1 half, bam. y minus 3 is on the bottom, x plus 1 is on the top. So any point you are interested in its slope at that point, you just plug in the x, y coordinate of that point. So you did a point on this ellipse, and you're curious about the slope at that point, you just plug in both the x and the y coordinate. We're not used to using the entire point as an input. This is like the first place you get to see that happen. Okay, okay. Um, now look here. Uh, we, we know, we, we've done the derivatives of all the trig functions. You still have to memorize them. You want to have that ready for Thursday. Uh, we haven't talked yet about the derivatives of the inverse trig functions. Yeah. All right, so this will be, well, we'll see. This is probably going to be the last thing we'll talk about today. Uh, inverse trig derivatives. Shoot. Now, think about the fact that they put this topic in this section. Huge clue as to how we're going to figure these out. So let's start with the most basic one. So pretty much the same way we figured out the natural logs derivative, we're going to do the same thing here. What can I do to both sides so that it's not inverse sign anymore? So like with natural log, we did e to both sides, so we killed the natural log. We do the same thing here. What's the inverse of inverse of sine? Sine, right? If I take the sine of both sides, will that not kill the inverse? Won't I have a function I know the derivative of? It's going to involve implicit differentiation, but shit, I know the derivative of sine. Damn straight. So if I take the sine of both sides, these kill each other. You guys take the derivative. Find y prime.
Okay. So the derivative of sine y is cos y times y prime. The derivative of x is 1. So y prime is 1 over cosine y, otherwise known as secant. This is not satisfactory. I had a function of x. I'm trying to figure out its derivative. And now I have the derivative in terms of y. Not satisfactory. How about the shit? Now, this is very pre-calculus-y, right? Um, if sine y equals x, what triangle does that set up? We put y. That's the angle is y. And sine of y equals x. So what do I know about any sides of that triangle? Which side has to be what? There's another way to do this with the identities, but personally I like drawing this triangle though. If sine y is x, and what is sine defined to be the ratio of? Which sides? If you like Sokotoa, Sokotoa is bullshit, but if it helps you, okay. Yeah, so it's going to be... Sign, sign is y. Sign likes y. That's what we should all know. We shouldn't know Sokotoa worth anything. Sign y. Sign likes y. So it's going to be x. And 1, of course, is the hypotenuse. Does everybody see how that came to be? We had a problem like this, I think, on the warm ups or something, where we was trying to figure out the tangent of the inverse cosine of something. We had to draw the triangle that it represented. We're doing exactly that. If I write sine y equals x, what does y have to be physically? y has to be an angle. So there must be a triangle that represents what this is trying to say. I know basically what sine is referencing as terms of a ratio. It's the ratio of the y side to the hypotenuse. This isn't true, but I like to think of sine as the percentage of the hypotenuse in the y direction. And cosine is a percentage of the hypotenuse in the x direction. Don't come at me with squared bullshit. It's, it's, it's not exactly true, but it's a way to keep the track. It especially helps if you go to physics and you start talking about vectors and stuff. Now, what do I need to know? Secant of y. And secant is 1 over cosine. So if I knew the cosine, and to know the cosine, what am I missing? Yeah, the x piece. Right, this piece. How do I get this piece? You talked about this old Greek dude earlier, right? This would be the screw root of what? This plus this is that, you know, squares. So this squared minus that squared. Pre-calculus should have beat this kind of shit in your brain like crazy. That is one purpose of pre calculus is to do that too. So that when you hit these things, it isn't such a huge deal. And you're like, well, Jeff, I didn't have much. Uh, so what, what's y prime then? What's the secant of y then? Cosine. What's the cosine would be the x piece over hypotenuse. So secant would just be the reciprocal of that. So I get 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. That is the derivative of inverse sine. Now, real quick, um, what's the restriction on x here? <clears throat> The minute x gets a, you know, to be 1 or more, or negative 1 or less, this is going to freak the shit out. You can see that? It's going to become all kinds of complex. And at 1, of course, the negative 1 is going to become all kinds of undefined. So my, it's got to be between negative 1 and 1. Now, uh, inverse sine, in order for sine to have an inverse in the first place, all right, real quick, I want to make sure you guys understand. We just proved that the derivative inverse sine is this. Okay, that's another derivative rule to have down, right? Okay, 
Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the stuff behind the scenes here. Here's sign. In order for sine to have an inverse, what has to be true about any function in order for it to have an inverse? Yeah, well, not any function, but in this case, I have to restrict its domain so that it passes the Holt. Yeah. So I have to restrict it, of course. It makes sense. I'm going to restrict it like that. I like it. And uh, I don't want to say this. So here I've got, this can go from negative 1 to 1. What is this and this? Negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now, this is the range of the sine. So what will it be for the inverse sine? The domain. So that domain really is the same as this domain, except this doesn't include negative 1 and 1. In fact, what is the slope of the sine at pi over 2? So what would the slope be for the inverse? Undefined. It would be infinite, right? So that kind of makes sense why the slope actually excludes those values. But it's cool with everything in between because the function is defined for everything in between. Right, how much of what I just said do you really have to understand? Not But... Just like with the natural log thing we talked about earlier, where the domains didn't match, so there's an idea, a broader idea of the absolute value, so the domains do match. You have very similar things happening with any other function that we take derivatives of. So here, you could lose some possibilities when you take a derivative, because the if it goes to infinity at some point, the derivative, I can't use it. So of course, this is cool at negative 101, and this one ain't just because it goes to infinity at those points. So the derivative could have a smaller domain than the original function, but it can't have a bigger one. That wouldn't make any sense. Okay, maybe? Maybe there's a broader idea there that doesn't really apply to this, okay. So couldn't you do very similar things for the other trig function? So like the other inverse trig. So here, you guys just do a couple and then we'll call it a day, okay? Uh, I want you to figure out the derivative for um, inverse cosine to be boring. Do inverse tangent and do inverse secant. Inverse secant could get a little freaky. All right, let me see. Let me catch up to you guys. So, let's be tangent y equals x. What's the derivative of tangent? Secant squared. 
course, you need to have that y prime piece there. Anytime for implicit the derivative you're taking has a y in it, you gotta have that times y prime chain rule piece. Equals one. Nice. So then y prime one over secant squared would be cosine, cosine squared. Now what's the the triangle I can draw for this? There's y. That's my angle is y. Tangent of y is x. Of course, tangent is the what piece over the what piece? The y piece over the x piece. I'm with you, though. So, y piece over x piece. So that's x and that's 1. And to get cosine, of course, I need the x piece over that hypotenuse. I need that hypotenuse. Well, that's a hypotenuse. This one's nice. This is straight up. It's just x plus 1. Yeah, x squared plus 1. So I end up with y prime. Is, is this thing squared now, right? Cosine would be 1 over this. Square just kills the square root. So I get 1 over x squared plus 1. So the derivative of inverse tangent of x is 1 over x squared plus 1. Now remember what the tangent looks like. In the whole discussion I just had about sine, you had to restrict the domain and so forth. What's tangent look like? It almost looks like a cube, dude, right? Between what and what? Where are the asymptotes for it? Negative yeah, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Whoa, huge. Asymptotes, asymptote, blah, blah, blah. There it is, right? So as long as you restrict the domain to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, you can just turn the sucker around. You got it. The range, then, is going to be negative infinity to infinity. which means the domain for this guy is infinity to infinity. It works for any x. Again, that's little side notes about what this works for. Okay. Do you start to see, though, I, I tried to tell you before, we have the limit definition of derivatives, and we learn a few basic derivatives. We learn some rules. We try to develop more rules of derivatives of functions, and we keep on using those together to get higher and higher level derivatives without having to go back Holy shit, can you imagine trying to do limit definition for inverse tangent? Inverse tangent of x plus h minus inverse tangent of x over h. Take the limit. Oh, uh, no. I don't blame you. I don't want to do that either. Uh, all right, how about this guy? Secant y equals x. What's the little triangle I can draw for later? So secant. It's going to be hypotenuse over the x piece, right? Because it's 1 over cosine. So hypotenuse over the x piece. So it's x to 1, like that. Just using the basic ratio that secant defines. Now take its derivative. What's the derivative of secant? This gets interesting. The derivative of secant y is secant y tangent y times y. Prime. I'm going to draw that sign as 1. That's nice. So I get y prime equals 1 over sec y tan y. Funny thing is, sec y is x. I like to say sec y. Right? Is that cool? Sec y is x. Kick ass. At least finally a piece of this is easy shit. And now I need the tangent of y. Ah, oh, okay, shit. So I get y prime equals 1 over x. And what's the tangent of y? What am I missing? Well, you know, that side. So it's going to be square root of x squared minus 1. Good. So the tangent of y would just be that over that. Kabam. So, I mean, on the bottom of page 214, they've got all of the stuff. Not surprisingly, let me make sure you guys understand. If the secant of y derivative is 1 over x, blah, what's, the, what's uh, inverse cosecant going to be? Negative this. You're going to love that shit. Yes? Uh, is this going to be relevant for the third test coming up? Oh, yeah. Because 
Test coming up goes through section 3.6, and this is section 3.5. It was right in the heart of that. I like it. Oh, shit. This is summer. You guys knew that when you signed up for it, right? Whatever, Jeff. You jackass. Yes, I can. Um, <laughs> I've got a, it's insane for me, too. I'm teaching two of these things. Holy shit. And you're taking one. That's bad enough. Yeah, just remember that. Um, okay, so tomorrow I'll have the answer key for that practice test. Um, we have a little bit left in Section 3.6 to cover. We did most of it. So most of tomorrow is going to be devoted to review. So please, dear God, come with questions or else we're just going to sit here staring at each other because I'm not going to come with much of anything prepared on my end because I have to leave it open for you guys. Cool.